Monday. Oops. Oh, I guess that makes an audible thing. She was um, not really feeling too good, but I think she'll be better today. I think she's coming in today around noon. Um, Please tell her I said hi. Yeah, of course. Okay, so I guess we're being recorded. We should stop with the personal <laughs> chit chat, which I am proud to do. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Esty. Hi. And Sejin is here. Hi, Sejin. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, very well, thank you. <laughs> Good. Oh, it looks like we have somebody new. Woohoo. Yeah, I invited my friend, Kayo. Kayo is here. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Kayo. Thank you for inviting someone. <laughs> Sejin, you rock. Hi, Margo. <laughs> thank you. Taylin, hi Taylin. Alexa, answer. Hi. Oh, hi. hello. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I can't see you. I know because I answered on the. Uh, uh, let me call you back on my Echo device, and then you'll be able to see. Oh. And Margo, can you please mute if you're. Yeah, sorry. Having, thank yeah. you. We are actually recording at the moment, so. Welcome, but watch what you say, everyone. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I had a call come in just as I had connected. No, no, not a problem. I, that was a joke. My feeble attempt at a joke. I know. Everybody say a prayer for Dina. She's having surgery as we speak. My gosh. Yeah, knee surgery. Absolutely. Mega prayers. Is Lauren still up here to help? Is that why she came up? Yeah, she is, and she's with her, so, <clears throat> so they're all in the hospital as we speak. Her surgery started at 8.30. Good. Um, we will miss them tremendously, but I'm glad they're together. They're here in spirit. Yes. Um, be, you know, online back with us soon. All right. Okay, talk to you in a minute. So we still have about nine minutes. Does anybody have work from last week that they would like to share? Why did you put her on the Yeah, phone? but I, I have to get it. Go get Go it. Downstairs, if I make it upstairs, I'll show you. <laughs> we'll wait. You're worth <laughs> waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Shirley is away. So we may have a small group today, which is fine. Guess I should spotlight me. I'm excited about our artist for today, but I'm not going to start talking about her just yet. She's actually, the artist for today has just installed a piece in New York City. I should look up the exact location so I can tell people where to go to see it. I'm gonna do that in the minutes remaining.
Madison Square Park is where it is. Is it outside? Yeah, it's outside. It's oh. Madison Square Park. Yeah, I saw it. It's great. She just installed it when? This past weekend, I thought. No, no, no. It's a few weeks there. I, I was there last week. Wow. It's across from Italy, this park, on 23rd and... So it's the east side? It's, the, it's from 5th or Broadway to Park, to the other side of between 23rd and 25 or something like that. Between 5th and Broadway and between 23rd and 25th. No, no, not 5th. It's either 5th or Broadway there. I don't know how, you know, they are. Uh... Oh, right. Is it, blend. Is it near MSG? Is it near what? No. Hmm. It's across the street from Italy, from this uh, big deli, or uh, if you know. Oh. Uh, 11 Madison Street. Okay. So it's, it's further downtown and it's midtown, but. 23rd. Kind of west. Mid, but more west than. I mean, uh, sorry, east and west, sorry, is what I meant to say. It's near Flat Iron Building. Yeah, it's just across. The park is just there. And you loved it, Esty? I loved it. It's very unique. And then I saw a program on the CBS the next morning about, yeah. She was just interviewed, yeah. Yeah, the, the way that they brought, they brought the logs from the forest was on to Manhattan, like a, like they bring the Christmas tree on, uh, you know, before Christmas. Yeah, so right. You may be a guest speaker in today's class. Oh, no, no, I won't be. Okay, I'm showing you my uh, Alaibu thing. If you can see, I don't know because it's on glass. So, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Ooh. spotlight. Very nice. <gasps> wow. Oh, you reverse glass painted it? Yeah. Oh, it's <gasps> wonderful. And Cebu. <laughs> Me and Ibu. <laughs> Beautiful. I wanted you to feel at home, Liz, so uh, here. It's actually similar to the mask I was painting, too. Yeah, I, I had something similar yeah. that I, I bought in Myanmar in Burma some time ago. They're all the same. Okay. Very okay. nice. I like, I like the textural effects. You always, you always do texture. It's what I like best about your work. Hold it up it? again. That's it? Hold it up again. Oh. Yeah, I really like how you, you continued the textural things in the background. Yeah. Is there more than one glass that no, you painted no. on? No, no. One no? Oh. But you did the mask shape first, correct? And then the background. Yeah. Yeah. So just the technique that Ibu taught you. Everything I know is either from you or from him. That's it. I had no life before. <laughs> okay. That, that's, I'm summing up now. <laughs> Well, it's a great piece. I like it a lot. And Alice just joined. Hi, Alice. How are you? Okay, okay. I missed all this. I've been out in the real live world. We missed you. Yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome home. Yeah. Are they thinking about starting in-person stuff or? Uh, we have been talking about it on and off. Yeah. Now that it's warmed up, I don't know, we may, we may be allowed. There has been some talk of using the, 
garden room where we originally had class or doing something in the park, but yeah. nothing is definite yet. Okay. So I, I can't make any promises. And excuse me, they're not thinking about making a hybrid. It's too hard to do both. Or... Um, we talked about that also, but it may be too difficult to do that. The problem with hybrid is we would have to have a videographer. And um, because if you remember from in-person classes, it's difficult for me to stay in one spot. And in order to do Zoom as well as in-person teaching, I would have to be pretty stationary. I, I can't teach that way. Yeah. So we'll see. I'm actually gonna be attending soon a meeting that's gonna be hybrid and I wanna see how that's gonna work. So hybrid means like some people are in person, some people are remote? Yes, yeah. Oh. So there has to be a way to hook up a projector to a computer in order to capture the whole experience. For yeah, you need a lot of technology to do that. No, not a lot, but it, you have to have something extra. Yeah, if you did it in the, in the garden room, there's like a big TV. Um, yes. So, I mean, even if I was there, just holding the phone that's hosting the Zoom meeting and just following you around, that, you know, gets people who are on like, you know, Zoom a chance to participate. That actually would work. Yeah. Will you introduce yourself to everyone, please? Oh, right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm Heidi's little assistant. So I'm just here doing little introductions and hosting this, this meeting and, you know, just dropping in while Heidi's out for, uh, for the day. So um, I've seen the class before. So you guys have a uh, huge talent. Um, so happy to be here. Thank you, Andrew. You were, at the walk. you were at the art walk, weren't you? At the art walk, yep. I remember you, yeah. No, I, I hear you. I remember you too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andrew, I think, did you let two people in? There seem to be two people. We waiting. have two more people. Ah, here we go. I've got it. They are now joining. Good. So, I think, is it 10? Yeah, 10 01. Let's begin. Thank you, Andrew. We are delighted to have you here today and we're grateful for your help. So welcome everybody. I am Liz and I am so excited to meet, to meet everyone here today at the Hoboken Library's Art at Home class. We are in the final class for May and May has been our month to celebrate Asian American and Pacific Island Heritage Month. And we have been focusing on artists from those particular cultures of which there are many. We've only really scratched the surface of, of the people of those ethnicities who live in the United States. And we will continue throughout the year to celebrate artists of all different cultural ethnic and racial backgrounds. Thank you so much to the Hoboken Library for allowing us to celebrate the arts and allowing us to look at artworks from artists from such diverse backgrounds. It's really exciting to learn about new artists and new cultures at the same time. Today, our artist of focus is Maya Lynn who is a particular favorite of mine. But before we begin, I want to remind folks, if you wouldn't mind muting your mics, there will be plenty of opportunity for you to join our conversation later on in the class. And I always welcome comment and input, but for now, if you could please mute. And we're not gonna do a full round of introductions today, but I know we have a new student with us today and I wanna welcome her. And it's Keo. 
So, hi. Hi, nice to meet you. It's my first time. Very excited. I'm Kayo. I'm from Japan. So, Kayo, I'm spotlighting you just for a moment. We're delighted to have you here with us today, and you're going to have a great time. Thank you so much. So we are artists of all different levels, Kayo. Mm -hmm. And we're all learning together. Yes, yes. I, I'm not I'm not a very good good <laughs> but uh, I want to learn. Kayo, this is the first thing that I want you to learn. In mm -hmm. this class, you are an artist. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are so welcome. Today, we're going to start talking about Maya Lin's work. We're going to le learn a little bit about her life and her philosophy of art, her aesthetic. We're going to look at some of her pieces, although I personally believe there isn't a photograph on earth that does her work justice. It's extraordinarily beautiful and I don't know, I have not been able to find a representation of her work that really shows how fabulously beautiful it actually is. And then I'm going to tell you the supplies that you're going to need. I'm going to talk about the projects that you can create, and then you're going to go to work. All right. Maya Lin, she's pretty famous. I'm guessing that most of you in this class, if not all of you, have heard of her before particularly for her sculpture, her monument, dedicated to the veterans of the Vietnam War. It is a monument, a memorial in Washington, D.C. It was very controversial at the time it was built. Many people did not like the design of it, but thank God it was chosen because it has become one of the most popular memorial public sites in the United States today. And if you have ever been there, you will know firsthand how powerful an emotional experience it is. And it really represents a lot of what Maya Lin's work is all about. It is one with the environment in which it is situated. It is made from natural materials. It is made from basalt rock. It is cut right into the earth where it is located. And it's harmonious with its surroundings. It is not something that is plunked down on top of the earth. It is something that is molded and melded into the environment in in which it is found. So Maya Lin's work is not intended to be an imposition or an addition. It's intended to be something that is, that is at one with nature, that in a way complements or helps nature. She believes that nature is the most beautiful thing but she doesn't feel that she can ever come close to replicating the beauty of nature. She was born on October 5th, 1959. She was born here in the United States. Interestingly enough, she didn't even realize she was of Chinese heritage until she was older, like when she was in her 30s. Her parents were both Chinese, they immigrated to the United States in the 1940s, the late 1940s. Both of her parents were academics. Her father was a ceramicist and the dean of the Ohio University College of Fine Arts. So he was a major artist in his own right. Her mother, born in Shanghai, was a poet and a professor of literature at Ohio University as well. Her aunt was an architect, probably believed to be the first female architect in modern China. 
So she comes from her design and architecture ability through her family line. Okay, this is an interesting thing about her childhood. She didn't have many, she claims, she says that she did not have many friends when she was growing up. She pretty much stayed home. She loved to study, she loved school. She took independent courses at Ohio University when she was in high school and she learned to cast in bronze at the school's foundry. She attended Yale University, earned a Bachelor's of Art in 1981, and also at Yale earned her Master of Architecture in 1986. She calls herself a designer though, and not an architect, and also calls herself a sculptor. In her early years, she spent a lot of time at the Indian mounds in Ohio, near where she grew up, and I have visited them. If any of you have ever been to the Hopewell and the Adena Indian Burial Mounds, they are really, really beautiful. And if you ever get a chance to go to that part of Ohio, I really recommend it. They're, they're really wonderful places to visit. And she claims that a lot of her artwork today has been influenced by the experiences that she had there as a child visiting the Native American Indian burial mounds and getting this affinity with earthworks and the beauty of the natural world. She Liz? is, yes. Hi, a quick question. If Could you okay. uh, put, hello, good morning. In the chat box, yes. If you could put the reference to the um, burial grounds in Ohio. I would love to put that on my list. I'm doing that right now. Thank you so much. And I might even be in that area later uh, this fall. Oh, you're going to love visiting there. Thank you. The culture is very deep. Oh my God, they made beautiful dolls, just saying. Beautiful, beautiful, figurative pieces in the Adena tradition. Um, oh, this may be a new person just joined us. Uh, welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, we're talking about Maya Lin, wonderful Chinese American sculptor, designer, and artist. We're going to talk about her work, look at her work, and then we are going to create our own work inspired by Maya Lin. I want to read to you a few quotes of Maya Lin from herself. I think it's going to help to explain her work. And then we're going to jump right into look at, looking at some of the JPEGs that I found of her work. So here's the first quote from Lin. I'm very much a product of the growing awareness about the ecology and the environmental movement. And when she was in college, an undergrad at Ohio University, she was a big mover and shaker in their environmental movement. And I just found out today that she's on the board of Natural Resources Defense Council, which is my personal favorite environmental organization. I'm going to put that in the chat box too. Sorry for the aside. So she is, she prides herself also in being an environmental activist. And you're going to see some of that. It's apparent in her work as well. So let me start the quote again, sorry. Lynn said, I'm very much a product of the growing awareness about ecology and the environmental movement. I'm very drawn to landscape and my work is about finding a balance in the landscape, respecting nature, not trying to dominate it. Even the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is an earthwork. All of my work is about slipping things in inserting an order or a structure, yet making an interface so that in the end, 
rather than a hierarchy, there is a balance and tension between the man-made and the natural. So as opposed to what we're used to in public art, the man on a horse, the soldier on horseback, or the statesman on horseback, Lynn wants her pieces to interact with the nature around it, not dominate it, not be on top of it, but be one with it. All right. And here's another quote. Lynn believes that art should be an act of every individual that is willing to say something that is new and not quite familiar. In her own words, Lynn's work originates from a simple desire to make people aware of their surroundings, not just the physical world, but also the psychological world we live in. So, again, the Vietnam War Memorial, she wants it to have an emotive experience for the people who visit it. Even she was on the board of selectors, of curators, who helped to pick the memorial for the 9-11 site. And you can also get a sense of her aesthetic from how emotive and how emotional that memorial is as well. You can tell what her goal is and what she's trying to create for the visitors to her site. Lynn also explores themes of juxtaposing materials and a fusion of opposites. Quote, I feel I exist on the boundary, somewhere between science and art, art and architecture, public and private, east and west. I am always trying to find a balance between these opposing forces, finding the place where opposites meet, existing not on either side, but on the line that divides. Love that. And finally, the final quote. My work originates from a simple desire to make people aware of their surroundings. And this can include not just the physical, but the psychological world that we live in. I might have read that already, so forgive me. But I love that, that's worth emphasizing. I love that her work is about evoking feelings thoughts and ideas. It's not just about the visual. It's also about the conceptual and the psychological. She's working now on a series of pieces that are about missing things, about the great extinction that the world is going through now. And I just read another article in the New York Times about an extended project that she's doing in the Northwest, in Oregon, in the state of Washington, where she's building land bridges and um, these beautiful basalt structures. And she's working with Native American tribal groups from that area, chronicling the species that had become extinct and also chronicling the lost history of the Native American people from that part of the world. So usually in Washington and Oregon, we think about the survivors of the Lewis and Clark expedition, but Lynn is trying to recapture the lost stories of the Native American peoples from the tribal groups who are still surviving in that part of Washington and Oregon. All right, now we're gonna look at some of her work. Give me a second to open up some of her images. And then we can share the screen. Anyone have any thoughts? 
The article that I read about the work she's doing in the Northwest, you want to try and find it. I believe it was either the New York or the New York Times. So if you Google Maya Lin, I'm sure you can find. So Liz, I had two comments. Absolutely, go for it, Jane. Uh, the first was, I'm absolutely bowled over by the, by her kind of straddling the ground between art and architecture, because I think that she shares that aesthetic with many really sensitive architects who want their work to be kind of a living extension of the environment. Um, the second was that, I'm sure you're aware, but um, there's the new, the ghost forest installation. Yes, we were just talking about that. Go ahead, say some more. Yeah, so I, I haven't seen it, but I would like to. It's, it can't be very far, Madison Square Park. And um, I've just dropped it in, dropped the link into the chat box for anybody who wants thank to you. read. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Esty's been there too. We were just talking about it and uh, she loved it. Nice. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that more in a minute, Esty. I wanna hear your thoughts on it as well. But here, here is the Vietnam War Memorial. And Lynn, her description of it is, it's as if I took a knife and cut a wound in the earth. And my memorial is my healing. It is a process of a healing of the wound. So controversial as it was in the beginning, including the fact that people were not happy with the fact that she was Asian American, it has now become one of the most beloved memorials in the country. Millions of people visit the site on an annual basis. They leave letters to their loved ones. They leave gifts, mementos. There's even a room in the Smithsonian that houses all the items that are left in memory of people who lost their lives in the Vietnam War. On both sides of the conflict, I believe. So it is completely unobtrusive. It melds into the environment around it. But as you get closer, there are like 55,000, almost 55,000 names carved into the rock of lost veterans who died in the war. It has also, I didn't realize this, it has become a memorial for Iraqi and Afghani war veterans as well. All right. She has also done the Civil Rights Memorial at the Dr. King Museum in Georgia. And here is the ghost forest. We'll just jump right to that next. This is right here in New York City. I haven't been yet, I'm dying to go. So I probably am getting this wrong, even though I just read about it, but these trees are in the process of dying and Lynn has had them uprooted from where they were growing in New Jersey. They are dying because the area where they were, were was flooded by salt water during some kind of major storm event. Was it Sandy? 
I, I don't know, but it was a major um, climate change storm event, and they were they were inundated with salt water in their root systems, so they are dying. And Lynn has had them replanted in Madison Square Park in New York City, not only to note their loss in New Jersey, but to commemorate the lost wetlands that New York City used to be. So before New York City was the megalopolis it is today, it was nature. It was marshland, it was wetlands. It was a place of extraordinary natural beauty. And she wants us to remember that. Esty, would you take a minute? How did it feel being there? It was very unique. I mean, all the, the trees that surround this park are uh, really big and alive, and those are like sticks with the, the humongous, with the like dead sticks with branches that are dried. And it's it's it very nice to see. I mean, uh, and, and uh, then then she put grass. I mean, everything is. I mean, you can sit on the grass. There are many people there. I mean, it's it's very nice. Uh, you can lean on the trees. I think they stuck them really deep uh, and cemented, probably. Probably cemented them. Oh, so it's meant to be permanent? No. It's temporary. It's until, I think, October or something. October or November. Did you feel a sense of loss or grief or um, did it create any feeling? It was very unique, like a step, like um, the dead and, and alive around it. And uh, I think if you know what you know, you feel maybe different. If you don't know what it is, maybe some people maybe even can think that it, this is how it is. This is the, this is a little forest that uh, is there. I think you have to know what you know. It's very unique, but only because I knew where I'm going, I think, mostly. Okay. It's very dense. I mean, there are a space, I think there are 49 of them. Uh, was, was there a, a relationship between the dark verticality of the trees and the tall buildings? Did you feel a relationship? No. Uh, and, it felt as if it, it felt as if it it could have been maybe always there. But I know that she I mean because I heard her speak that she brought trees uh, that did not go more than a certain height only because of the flatbed that took them from New Jersey wherever it is to Manhattan and the, to maneuver the streets. But they are very tall trees. I don't remember the height, but uh, all the same, not more than a certain height. Uh, and she laid them out in a grid, it looks like. It's a very uh, It's not really a grid. She also had to uh, make sure that she's not stepping on wires, on underground yeah. wires and telephone things. And it looks like it was always there. I didn't remember what was there before. I, although I was in this park before. It's as if it meant to be there, almost. Is this near the MetLife building? Yes. The Met, I don't know. It's yes, I know where this, and Barnes and Noble? No. No more Barnes and Noble. It's uh, no, 25th. Barnes and Noble is it on 14th Street. There is one next to Union Square. It's not. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. what I'm thinking of. Never this mind. Is, no. Madison and 25th. 23rd to 25th. It's, this is the, the mid, in the middle of the... Uh, okay. Got it's it one, block, one and a half blocks from the path, I believe, on 23rd. You go, okay. you go east. It's a gorgeous photograph. And it, what I'm struck by in the photograph visually is 
the extraordinary vertical lines of the trees juxtaposed with the vertical buildings. To me, it's very beautiful. Yeah, I can I can show you a picture with people sitting there in a circle. I mean, it's very lively there now. Uh, Thank you. All right, we, we got to move on though. I want us to get to doing our work. But let's look at a couple more pictures. One of the things that I'm most taken with that Lynn is working on lately is her water imagery. So she has been working on a project about lost water or the flow of water. Like, for example, she was studying the Atlantic Shelf which is the mountain range underneath our coastline. And she's created a series of pieces of various sizes in different materials about the Great Atlantic Shelf, which is right off the coast of New York and New Jersey, Massachusetts and Connecticut, that I find these pieces so these are smaller works, obviously, than the ghost forest. I find these pieces really beautiful. So these are about the mountain range, the ups and downs, the valleys that you find underneath the sea. The effects of what water does to rock surfaces, And I believe this piece is made from paper. She likes to use recycled materials. Again, she is an environmentalist. Okay, we're gonna look at a few more pictures quickly. She worked on a very long, extensive project about the Hudson River, which of course we can all relate to living where we live now. And she's done these images of what the flow of the river looks like, but not in water, but in various different materials. So these are little plastic beads. But this piece, I forget the dimensions of this piece, it's huge. I love this piece. She also, in Reno, Nevada, she cast, I think in bronze or silver, a part of the Colorado River that is now hanging in the lobby of some hotel in Reno. This shows, this is a larger installation, I believe, of the Hudson River piece that I just, I just showed you a detail. She's, so she's fascinated by the flow of river, of water, how bodies of water change their shape, how they sometimes evaporate and disappear, how we are losing bodies of water, how the ice caps are melting and creating more water and changing the sea level. So water is definitely an area of fascination for her. Again, she uses all different kinds of materials. I think, let's make this the last one we yeah, look at. Uh, one 
uh, I don't know some, if you were talking to all of us. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what was just said. And if you're not, please remember to mute. So this is, she often does pieces using plywood, layers and layers of plywood. This one is also about the flow of a river. And I think it's a mock-up for a larger piece that she has created. So again, I mean, I really couldn't find any photographs that do her work justice. I, I think they're completely, the photographs of her work are completely inadequate. The things that she's doing in Oregon and Washington State now are breathtaking. <laughs> Excuse me. I couldn't find pictures online yet for them. Maybe some of you can, and you can send them to me to share. <coughs> Excuse me, bad allergy day. All right, so we have quite a bit of time left in class. Does anybody have anything they want to talk about with about Maya Lynn? <laughs> Hi, Liz. Hi. It's Pema. Hi, Pema. <laughs> Did you know more? You had mentioned that she didn't even realize she was of Chinese descent or something. Yes. Yeah, she realized when she was in her 30s and became very much interested at that point. Um, they don't talk too much about that in the information that I have about her. She did help to design a piece for the Chinese Museum in Chinatown in New York. But I didn't find much more about that. But her heritage, her Chinese heritage is, is quite amazing. Yeah, it's surprising that she didn't realize then. So such later in life is curious to maybe I'll have to do some research. It's not unusual. I mean, I am a second generation person. My parents hid a lot from us because they were working so hard to become Americanized. Sure. So Makes from sense. my own personal experience, I know it's not unusual for people to not share their back yeah, I guess, with their children. Yeah, I guess it's the same as my dad was Tibetan from Lhasa. And when we were young, we were told to just have one language in the household. So my mom's Irish, so we just spoke, I mean, she's American, but um, we only spoke English where my cousins who are full Tibetan, they did speak Tibetan in the house. So I didn't really learn Tibetan because back then they would, they didn't want you to speak anything but English. You know, I'm 48, so it's not that long ago, but you know, now it's encouraged to speak so many languages because you're going to learn English in school anyways, in, at least in America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I so had that same I experience. Know, I don't know how you feel about that, but I certainly feel, I feel shortchanged that my parents never shared with me much about their background. But in hindsight, they might not have known that much themselves. So, right. I, we definitely learned a lot about the Tibetan heritage. It was just more about speaking the language. Um, not that we weren't, didn't have access to it. It was just not, it was just discouraged, I think, more by, the, by society or the school system at that time. Um, you know. So, and then also because my mom was not a Tibetan native, she was English speaking. Right. It didn't, it didn't help. Although she, she, when my parents were married, she lived in India and she lived with my dad's family. She actually probably knows a little bit more Tibetan than I do. I used to know a lot more when my grandfather was alive, but it kind of forgotten it. So I'd have to take some classes at this point, but 
Um, my mom often comes, tells me different words that she knows. So I feel like she knows more than I, even though she's just an Irish girl from the Bronx. <laughs> Mm -hmm. These these are the ironies, sometimes sad, of the immigrant experience. Right? Yep. Yes. In yeah, my, I in my I wanted to add to add to that. Um, my parents were refugees from Nazi Germany, and so German was German was forbidden at home. Um, and you know, a lot of fear associated with anything, anything German, the sound of the language, although they spoke to each other. Um, I wanted to also mention back about Maya Lin that I remembered that she was very young and I just looked it up. She was 21 when she was awarded the Vietnam Memorial Commission and there was some controversy about it. There was a great deal of controversy. And so I think it's fascinating that at the time she didn't even see herself as being anything but, you know, pure American. And I'm sure that the the press was looking at her, you know, she has Asian features. So, you know, why are we giving her this commission? So it's really interesting, her, her background and, for, you know, she's so fierce in her convictions and her ability to express her art. I love that. Yes. Yeah, a large part of the controversy was that she is Asian American. And um, Liz, the one really thing I really things were said about her. Liz, she's Asian American. Yes, who's who's Heather. I really love her atlases when she goes and she digs deep into the old atlases. I think those are fascinating. Yes, that one piece that I showed of the Atlantic shelf was made from old atlases. So thanks for, for bringing that up, Heather. Heather, I can't find you. I hate when that happens. I would have spotlighted you, but for some reason I can't find your picture. Forgive me. Yeah, so she uses old, old things. She loves using recycled materials. I think she's just brilliant. She has the combination of all those things that I believe make art art she has the skill and technique she has the extraordinary concept she has the ability to make her viewers think and wonder about what she's created her work is pure beautiful genius all right so what are we going to create today we're coming to my favorite part You're going to need paint today. If you do not have paint, anything liquid, not sticky liquid, however, I mean, kitchen items would work, ketchup, pudding, um, but you're going to want to have water probably to thin those kind of liquids down. Watercolor paint will work, acrylic paint would work. Inks would be great. All of those kinds of things would be fine. If you have Plexi, that would be terrific. A sheet of Plexi would be wonderful. Glass. If you have an old picture frame and you can take the glass out, that would work as well. Just the sheet of glass. An old mirror, perfect. If you don't have plexi glass or a mirror, aluminum foil, a flat smooth sheet of aluminum foil, Wax paper or parchment paper would work really well. All of those kinds of things would be great. If you have another thing that might work, um, a picnic table tablecloth. You know, those heavyweight plastic tablecloths and you don't mind getting paint on it. 
something that you could wipe clean, that would work really well. You need brushes, you need water, paper towels. Oh, and another thing you could use if you don't have tin foil, plexi, mirror, glass, etc. You can use a takeout lid. Plastic takeout lid would be great. As long as it has one side that's flat and smooth. This one actually is no good, but this one would be great. A plastic dinner plate would be super. Something that's smooth, non-absorbent, and flat. And I think that's it. Miss, can I ask if a baking and tray baking. works? A tray would work as long as it's flat. Okay, thank you. And it's non-absorbent. You don't want to use a wooden tray unless it's laminated. And then the final thing, if you're lucky enough to have one, a roller, but it's not essential. And you do need paper, some kind of paper. It could just be photocopy paper or heavyweight drawing paper. You don't want anything with a textured surface like watercolor paper, that would not be good. Or anything slick like cardboard, you want something that's um, fairly soft, but not heavily textured. All right, questions, any other questions? I'm gonna put in the chat box a list of materials that you need. So something, first of all, smooth, flat, non-absorbent surface like glass, plexi, tin foil, wax paper, plastic dish, mirrors, etc. And brushes, paper towels, paper, water, and paint or colored liquid. Okay. So we'll give everyone a couple minutes to gather up all that stuff, and then I'm going to talk about what we're actually going to make. I'm going to just rearrange my space and pour out some paints. And just a reminder that I'm going to ask people to keep their phones muted. Many artists like to have quiet while they're working. And even the sound of pencil on paper can be a distraction to people. So thank you in advance, everyone, for muting your phones. And apologies for the sounds I'm going to make, but I don't quite know how to do it, prevent that from happening.
putting my paints down. I'm hoping that everyone is back in view of me at this point. And I'm going to start with an apology. But because of the limitations of Zoom, I'm going to have to work off camera and talk you through what I'm doing. And then I will have to hold up as I go. So in other words, you're not going to be able to see what I'm doing as I'm doing it. I will talk about what I'm doing. And as I finish a step in the process, I'll hold it up and then you can see it. So what I want to teach everyone today is a process called mono printing. Why have I chosen to do that after looking at Maya Lin's work? It's all about the water and the flow of water and liquids. We saw how Maya Lin is really taken with nature and the changes in nature, in particular in the movement and the flow of water, the way the oceans move, what water does to rock surfaces, how water tends to dry up, during climate change events and how ice melts and changes the volume of water, etc. Mono printing is all about capturing the movement of liquid, liquid being paint. So I thought, how fun would it be if we experiment and play around with the effects that mono printing can create? The whole idea of mono printing is to use a flat, very smooth surface on which you paint very quickly lines, shapes, images, and then you lay your paper on top of that surface and rub the paper, rub or roll the paper if you have a roller, peel the paper off or what we call pull the print off your plate, the plexi or the foil that you painted on or whatever, the glass or the mirror or the plastic dish that you painted on, you pull the paper off and you have a mono print. Why is it a mono print? Because really you can only make one. Different from other forms of printing, it is not a print that you can replicate over and over and over again. It is a very fast, pretty much abstract way of creating an image. Any questions so far before I begin? Excuse me, Liz. Absolutely. Fire Hi there. away. Hi there. Uh, how many colors are we thinking to use? Are you going to be um, restrictive or are you just going to go for it? I was just about to talk about that. Thank I'm you. I'm so glad you asked that question. I'm going to restrict my palette. I'm thinking water. 
So I'm going to work within the blue, green, gray family. And in fact, I'm just going to start out with blue and white. I don't care what colors you folks use. However, if you have never done mono printing before, you might want to start with only two colors. But if you're feeling adventurous today and you want to go for color, do it. There are some of you in this class who have done mono printing with me before. And if you're feeling experimental today, have at it with the color. All right, does that answer everyone's color question? If you need, many of us are image-based people and you need to have an image to start with, think water, think seascape, think waterfront right here in Hoboken. If you want to create an image that is reminiscent of the Hoboken waterfront, go for it. I personally, in mono printing, prefer doing more abstract images. For me, it's more about line and shape and color and less about trying to create a realistic image. You will find that when your mono prints start, dr start drying, that you're going to want to add to it, which is fine. You can draw on mono prints. You can paint. You can do additional painting on top of your mono prints, et cetera, et cetera. All right, any other questions? Scrolling through, I see some people are already working. And some people are off camera, which is cool too. All right, at any point during your working process, if you have any problems or questions, feel free to ask me. Here's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to paint on my plexi, not on my paper. I'm painting on my plexi. You can't really see what I'm doing because I have to keep it flat on my table. I will hold it up once I finish painting so you can see what I've done. I'm going to bring my easel closer. Once I paint it on the plexi, I'm going to put it on the easel. Oh, one thing in terms of thickness of paint, it depends how large your piece is. If you are doing a smaller piece, you can make it more watery. If you're doing a larger piece, you might want to have it a little bit more thick. Your liquids could be a little bit thicker. Do know though, the thicker your paint, the faster you're gonna have to work. The wetter your paint, the more time you have, the slower you can go. All right, here I go. I'm working quickly. It's hot today. My paint is already starting to dry. So I'm working very fast. I'm keeping my brush very wet. Darn, I don't have the best brushes here. I should have checked that earlier. I'm just using white and blue, as I mentioned before, for starters. Very, very fast. And abstract. All right. And here's basically, and it's really dripping a lot, so I'm only going to show it really fast, how my plexi looks. I hope you all got to see it. Now, I'm laying the plexi back down on the table. And I'm laying my paper on top 
of the Black Sea. And I've made quite a mess here. Do be aware of the fact that mono printing can be messy. You do want to do it on a, on a flat surface. You want to have a flat surface. Once the paper is flat on the plexi or whatever flat surface you're using as your plate, you gently rub the back of the paper or if you have a roller, you can roll the paper. One thing I'm noticing, I'm working on such a large piece of paper that my paper is really bubbling and rippling. That's going to be interesting. And now I am literally peeling. You can probably see my arm. I'm peeling or pulling my print off the plexi. And I have my mono print. I'm going to turn it so you can see more of what I've created. So as you can see, it's quite abstract. I can let it dry. I can work more into it. I can draw on it. I can paint on it. I can turn it in multiple directions. And again, it's really looking a lot like the movement of water in celebration of nature inspired by the work of Maya Lin. I love the fact that I can turn it in multiple directions. The beauty of mono printing is I can now take my plexi plate, wash it off, dry it, and that's key everybody. You really want to make it dry and do another mono print. All right, any questions? I see some people have been watching very closely, which is cool. Okay, if you don't have questions, have at it. Do your own thing. I'm going to take a quick trip downstairs to my sink and wash off my plate and do some more printing. Nothing in my chat box, so I'm assuming you're all okay. Yes? I saw a thumbs up. And again, it's up to you what colors you want to use. Maybe you're thinking about the earthworks that, that Lynn did and, and you want to do more ground, earthy kind of colors, browns and greens, instead of blues and greens and grays. Maybe you have different sized pieces of plexi. You can print on top of your mono print. All right, I'll be right back, everyone.
everybody behaving? I'm back. <laughs> Anybody having problems? Should have brought more paper towels. Okay, I gotta get more paper towels. I'll be right back. So I'm going to put my first print over here to dry. It's pretty much dry already. It's so hot today. And do a second one. Hi, Lynn. Yes. Could you go over again? It took me a lot of time to get everything together, just briefly. Right. I'm sitting here ready to make a mess, so tell me how to do it. Okay. So, do you have something with a flat, hard surface, smooth yes. surface? Yes. So, the first step is to take your paint. Yeah. And paint what you want on that flat surface. The second step after you painted yeah is to lay your paper on top of that surface the painted surface rub the yeah. paper on the back gently rub it and then peel the paper off the back okay and see what you've got you should have a beautiful print of now, what what a, excuse me what am I doing with the water you told me to get? You want to keep the paint relatively watery because oh. it's such a hot day. It's going to be drying out pretty fast. So use the water to just freshen up your paint as you go. Keep it moving and fluid. All right, I'm gonna not use these. So paint first and then lay the paper on top of what you painted. Rub the paper gently on the back and then peel the paper off to see the print on the front. <laughs> Another fun thing to do, you can scratch lines into what you've painted. And that will show up in your monoprint as well. Scratch lines with the hard end of 
the handle of the brush into the paint before you put the paper on top. I'm trying that in my print this time. So here we go with print number two. Now, if you've put enough paint on your plate, you shouldn't have to rub really hard. You should just be rubbing gently on the back of the paper in order to get a good impression on the front of your paper. Oh, I'm pulling print number two. Make sure you don't leave the paper on the plate for too long, particularly if you're using acrylic. It will stick and you'll never be able to get it off again. So you do have to pull your print pretty, pretty fast. Don't yank on it too hard. The paper will tear. Do it quickly, but gently. And oh, here, looks like crap. My print number two, if anyone, if anyone wants to look. It's kind of fun, very different from the first one, even with just two colors. I use the paint in a very different way. And another fun thing to do with mono printed paper is you can do wonderful collage work with these once they dry. Another thing to note with mono printing you won't get a completely flat, smooth surface. In printmaking, you will see texture. And that's fine. People often want to go back and fill in with paint. Don't do that. Let the texture shine through. Let the printmaking process do its thing. I just did it again. <laughs> You yeah. caught me. <laughs> Try not to fill it in and make it look solid. Try not to do that. Texture rules oh. in printmaking. It's a big mess here. All right. So I have to run now and wash this off again. This is this is a fun class because you get some free time without teacher throughout. Everybody's good though, I think. Let me scroll through and see if anybody looks troubled. All right, so you have to take it. Also, another tip, if you use different size brushes, you can get different effects as well. Forgot to mention that. And if you use different shape brushes, I've been using square shape brushes, but if you use round tip brushes, you're going to get different effects. <sighs> Don't forget to mute everyone. Please mute your speakers. All right, I shall return. I gotta go wash quickly or this paint is gonna dry on here forever.
back to do print number three. I might add a third color for a little variety.
Hmm. Like this one. Okay, print number three. Very different from the first two. Show the whole image. There we go. So you can see the the real fun part of mono printing is how fast you can do it and how different each print can be from the one before it. Starting with the same materials, you can go in many different directions. I'm building on my original idea, however. Keeping it going. So, which time do we get? Okay, I'm going to wash my plate one more time. I shall return. <laughs>
I'm gonna do one more print. I'm gonna add a tiny bit of black. You will find the thinner the lines you make, the faster they dry out, obviously, because you're using less paint. So that's something to be aware of. So you want to put those thin details at the very end. Prints. This is what happens when your paint dries. 
too quickly. Do have to work fast with mono printing. But I kind of like it. All right. So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, a suggestion, if you've done multiple prints, you might want to go back to your first one now and see, start thinking about ways you could add to it, if you like, maybe outlining some of the shapes with paint or marker, or continue to make more prints. We will stop in 10 minutes. I want to tell you about who we're doing for our first lesson in June. And also, if you want to share what you made today, I really want to see what you've made. Sometimes you'll find you like your plate as much as your print. And you don't want to wash it off. Someone has a question in the chat. Let's see.
My first print is very dry. I'm looking at it. Thinking, how can I work on it further? I'm going to play around with my graphite and emphasize some of the shapes that I'm seeing emerging. See what happens. Almost a figure here. Kind of a figurative thing going on. So I, apologies, I just sent everyone the list of supplies that you needed for today. It was sitting there in the chat box and I neglected to send it to you. So if you wanna keep doing mono printing at home, now you have the list. And one more minute and then we're going to talk about how today went and very briefly about what we're going to do next week and who are the artists we're going to talk about next week.
And you might want to take a quick look at what's happening with my first print. I'm not sure um, if I'm going to continue with this, but I just wanted you to see that even starting with an abstract image, you can go back into it and add more to it with different media. Let's turn this off. Still a little dark. That's a bit better. But I started with graphite, defining some of the shapes that I created in the print. It's getting a little figurative here. This is a person. And then there are multiple people emerging behind it. This could be waves down here. That's what I'm thinking. All right. So there are many, many options, many different ways you can go with mono printing. And I hope you enjoyed today. And I hope that I've turned you into people who love Maya Lin as much as I do, and that you'll all take the opportunity to go see her work right here in New York City at Madison Square Park. All right. I hate, hate, hate to make you stop. I hate interrupting the creative process, but we only have a short amount of time left in class, and I do want to first tell you about June. In June, we will be celebrating LGBTQ artists because June is National LGBTQ Month. And our first artist is an artist who's showing right now in Manhattan. He is not American, but um, he lives quite a bit of the year in the United States of America. So I kind of count him as an honorary American artist, and his name is David Hockney. And he's having a wonderful portrait show at um, the Pierpont, Pierpont Morgan Library right here in New York City. I have not been to see it. Looks like, Susan, you've been to see it. You're saying, no, you haven't been yet. Um, I have seen many- No, but I love it. I love him. Yeah, yeah I've seen many of his portraits. 
in many shows over the years and it's worth whatever you have to do to get in to see a show of his work. So we will be going back to our work in portraiture next week. We'll be reviewing the techniques and methods for doing portraits. I do uh, invite you to start looking for pictures of people that you might want to draw pictures of, whether they're magazine photos or family shots that you may have. Um, if you do family photos, you want to try and enlarge them and get them big enough so that you can really um, see the features of the person's face easily. If the pictures are too tiny, it becomes so much more challenging to try and draw their face. And you want to see someone full face. We're not going to be doing profiles or three quarter uh, images just yet. I want to review, review with you the proportions of the human face and how to draw full on facing front portraits. Those of you who are my experienced portrait people, we can work in color. Those of you who are doing portraiture, just really your novices at it, not to worry use pencil, eraser, and paper. That's just a terrific way to draw. All right. So David Hockney, let me put his name in the chat box for those of you who may not know him. Okay. That show is going to close at the end of the month, I think. Thank you, Alice. He's at the Pierpont Morgan Library. library and Alice says it's going to close soon so if you want to see it go soon okay so that's in the chat box for you all to see all right who's going to share I'll share. Um, it's just many, many prints, and it's just a background. And this is Robin? Yes, and it's just a background, and I use parchment paper, and it looks like eventually, I, I want to draw on it, but I think I'm going to um, put more paint on the paper that I used and see if I can do it without actually painting on it. It's just a simple, well, this is about six different layers. It's quite it's, beautiful. Thinking of the ocean. It's quite so, beautiful. It's going to happen. How did you find the parchment paper to work with? Was it difficult or? No, I, I, I have this size for making cookies that I got from Amazon. Uh -huh. so, and and it, it, it was like almost a little oily. So the paint didn't stick the way I thought it would. But anyway, I was using it, so I went ahead and kept using well, that's it. That's good, you don't want it to stick. So that's well, good. I, well, I mean, yeah. Stick, sir. yeah, okay. Good. So I'm gonna continue with that and see if I can draw something. Excellent, and parchment paper is compostable. Although with uh -huh. the paint, I don't know if you can do that with the paint on it. I have, uh -huh. I'll find out for you, remind okay. me. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Robin. I love it. Thank you. I want to see more. Anything else? I'll share, Heather. If I can find you, Heather. <laughs> I'm waving. <laughs> I'm having Heather problems. Here we are, Heather. Good. <laughs> I did something a little different because I, I have to. <laughs> I instead of paper, okay. Yeah, instead of paper, I use the material. Oh, nice. And then drew and glued and did stuff. It's hard to see with this light. It's a little hard. <coughs> to see. Um, it is. There's there's a bit of glare. Yeah, so you I know. printed you printed on paper. I printed on thin on, material on fabric. On fabric, yes. 
uh, that I had painted beforehand. Mm. So oh. what did you use for your plate? Um, well, I didn't do quite what you said. <laughs> I did uh, this. Oh my gosh, wow, I love that. And then wow. painted over it and then put the material. It's a print, but right. mm, not. So uh, yours is more like what we call collagraph printing. Yes, yeah. But it's, but it's still one, yeah, yeah. one time. And then um, I just, you know, outlined what I had printed and put cardboard pieces around it. Frame it. It's, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> I like it. It has a kind of anthropological, like tribal. Yeah. yeah, well, I don't know. I remember, I don't know if you saw it, but, you know, I was just in Atlanta and there was someone in their yard had done a maze in bricks and that. Uh -huh. and yeah, and, and Maya Lynn is all about you know the earth and creating things nice. like that. I don't know if it's a keeper, but it was, I like it. Thank you. Me too. Very clever use of materials. Thanks, Heather. See, this is what I love about mm -hmm. teaching art. I give you all the same directions. And you go mm. your own way, and that mm. is so much fun. Awesome. Um, I used parchment paper at first. Who's this, Sage? Uh, Pema. 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 I, I have like a roll of parchment paper sitting around that I used um, similar. I can't find you. Hold on. Oh, okay. I'm waving. Yes. And then the first one I did, it's hard to see probably. Yeah, I didn't. Oh, yeah, it's lovely. And then I, at the end, just started circling little dots with my Sharpie. I didn't like what I did here with stripes, so I just did some, just to accent the little pattern. And then underwater, yeah, that's yeah, cool. just to be a little, it was very, very <laughs> abstract. And then I tried to do something with a like a, a sun and the rocks and the ocean, but again, I wasn't too thrilled of how it was coming out. And just like you could see how the paper starts to bubble and warp. Um, and I was using different things to roll because I don't have a roller, so I was using like a glass, a plastic that had round um but then lastly i changed it to the cover of a egg carton a plastic cover and then painted inside here as my plate so i did like to represent it's hard to see because of my glare but the water some rock formations you were talking about like what erosion does to the ocean floor yes a little bit of sun and then this is the one that I like the most. I love abstract, but then this is the least abstract. It's just stripes of different colors. Um, again, from the egg crate carton, and then I took white paint and highlighted some of the stripes and the dots. It's hard to see because my watercolor is like a light palette. What happened? It's something. Uh, my 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 battery was dying. All right, I I, you were thing. very inventive. And I love, I love the metallic. Hold up the sun image one again. This one? Yeah. This one like is that. great. So oh, funny. Yeah. yeah. It's, I'm trying, you know, Liz, I'm trying to be more, less critical, <laughs> negative criticism of my own artwork because I, it's, I was like, oh, I don't really like how it's going, but it was, I was just trying to see like, can I make a yellow sun in the middle? But you know, once you start to roll it, it starts to obviously change the whole pattern and nature of it, which is the beauty of the, this type of artwork. Yes. It's a little I, unexpected. I would love to see you keep working on the sun. Okay. I think I share? a lot going for it. I love the kind of energy explosive mm -hmm. quality that it has. Nice. It's really, really, really beautiful. Thank you. 
You're welcome. I like how you experimented with all those different materials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how you learn. Yeah. Thank you. Terrific. All right. May I, sh may I share? Yeah, we've run out of time. Sorry. Oh, okay. I will send a picture. Um, one quick question. Yes. The library said that you, we wish to pick up supplies on the days that they're closed. So do you have an idea when we pick up supplies for June? I have no idea. Hmm. Okay. I have no idea. Andrew, are you back on? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, what was the question? When um, can we pick up supplies for June? It, it listed the date as May 31st and that it's closed that day, of course. Um, if there's an update, we'll be sure to email you. I haven't heard anything about any picking up supplies for June projects yet. Um, okay. But uh, once they're once I learn about it, I'll I'll send an email, um, you know, to everyone here. Okay, thank you. Or Andrew, probably it'll go on the website too, right? Um, yeah, it, it, if it, if it gets updated under the event, an update email should be sent anyway. Um, so I'll check the calendar on the uh, on the library website, and we'll update Thanks the Thanks so much. And um, Susan said she was going to send me a JPEG that goes for you all. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get a chance to share today, please send me a JPEG. Mm -hmm. um, Ko, do you have Ko? If you want to be on my mailing mm -hmm. list, can you quickly uh, just put in the chat box, Andrew? Can I just have a minute with Ko before we shut down? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And everyone here, make sure to look out um, for the next event um, that we're going to be um, marketing soon, the bookmaking on June 19th with oh, I right. Ibu. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, we're having a bookmaking workshop on June 19th, is it, Andrew? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Saturday. That Ibu is going to be running. It's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So Thank you, Liz. Thanks. So much fun today. I can't wait to see you in June. I can't believe it's June already. Thank you. I hope your whole book and art walk was fun. It was great fun. Oh, and so proud of all of you who were at the table. Congratulations, all the students who were at their table sold. So, woohoo. Bye. Good job. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Be well, everybody. Welcome, K.O. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And K.O., I'm, I'm holding on for a little longer. Oh, okay.